Hi, and welcome to Fail Lab Lectures. In this lecture, we'll be discussing about the Newton's third law of motion, friction, drag, and centripetal force. So, to start off with the, the Newton's third law of motion. Newton's third law of motion says, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. That means, say, let me take this example here. There is this book and this block which is both at rest, wall and book. So book is exerting a force Fb and the wall is exerting a force Fw. Since both are at rest, the magnitudes of both these forces Fb and Fw are equal. Vectorially what you can write is Fb is equal to minus Fw or the other way but both forces are acting in opposite direction but have the same magnitude hence both the book and the wall are not moving anywhere they are at rest. So is it applicable to bodies actually writing? Well it is. A rocket works on this principle without this third law of motion, rockets wouldn't have existed today at all. So here you get the thrust, the exhaust, the thrust, so that is Fp and uh, the body accelerates, the rocket accelerates in the upward direction. So again here Fa is equal to minus of Fp. So it's again an action reaction pair. So this kind of equation where the magnitudes are same but act in opposite directions, we call it as an action and a reaction pair, action reaction pair. And uh, this actually sums up my, the introduction about the Newton law. One has to be very careful while uh, solving problems and applying Newton laws um, on, you know, in the, in the coming uh, uh, chapters and the topics that we are about to discuss. So, um, so what do I have for you in this lecture? I have, uh, I'll be discussing properties of friction, types of friction and um, coefficient of friction of course, but the drag, the terminal velocity, centripetal forces, centripetal acceleration and a problem that is, which is my favorite and it will tell you why you should learn these chapters. What's the use of those chapters? Wait until you see. So what is friction? As we have discussed in the previous lecture itself, friction is one of the, for one of the type of forces and uh, friction is a vector and friction is the opposition that is offered for motion. So here let me take two blocks I'll draw the, the side view or the direct view in one sense. So there is one small block and uh, it is resting on a bigger block. It's going nowhere as you can see. This block is A and this block is B. So what happens in between the two blocks is since it is at rest, there is some sort of welding that takes place. Here you can see I have done some welding for real in this uh, you know, metal piece. So what happens here is uh, you know I have melted the metal with while during welding and uh, both stick together. But here something similar happens, something called as you know since it is cold, you don't need to supply heat. It's called as cold welding. <laughs> Just kidding. However, the uh, the atoms, the localized atoms here on the surface and underneath the surface of block A and on the surface of block B actually bind together. And hence, when I try to move this block A with a force F A, it opposes with the force equal to that of F A in but in the opposite direction. F since it is not moving, it is static, it's a static friction. 
that are that happens or that is present in the direction opposite that to that of the applied force and it occurs in the opposite direction. Hence here Fs is in this direction, Fa is in that direction and hence the body doesn't go anywhere. It is at rest. Both are at rest. And these bonds formed is the main reason why friction is present. Okay? So now we'll move to something called as the static friction, which is nothing but the same that I've explained right now, but uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see how it works in detail. So now, friction, static friction is one of the type of frictions. A static friction is a friction that is present when the bodies are not moving, when the bodies are at rest. Okay? So, you are considering two blocks again, say a, a bigger block this time, sitting on top of, uh, sitting on top is a smaller block that you are trying to push you know, with, the, with the force here, Fa, this is A, this is B, the middle block is B. So what happens here again, the bonds, you know, bond forms here at the point of contact of the surfaces of both A and B. So the body goes nowhere. And the friction F, Fs acts in the direction opposite to that of the applied force and hence the body goes nowhere. So static friction is present when the body is at rest. So what is the formula to calculate static friction? Fs is equal to mu n and n here is the normal force. So mu n, F is equal to mu n is normal force of this of the static friction. So it depends again on which body you are uh, actually uh, applying again you need to define again these are the basics of the Newtonian mechanics that I hope you have already practiced and learned from the previous lecture uh, so I won't be repeating it again here see the block okay the block here this is the important formula that I've written this is not a block so the block B and block A are in contact and at the point of contact the bonds form there is some sort of a welding that takes place cold welding Hence, the body offers resistance to motion due to the force that is applied Fa and the resistance offered is in, in the opposite direction Fs and acts along the line of, 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 the, of the points of contact. And this is the normal force which is always present as I said, uh, you know, in Newton laws when you solve problems in Newtonian laws, the first thing that you got to do is you draw a free body diagram and the first thing you do is draw the downward uh, you know, arrow and the upward arrow. The force due to gravity and force, uh, you know, the normal force contracting the force due to gravity. So, so this is how you get and the formula is Fs. We will discuss about this mu, mu s actually it is the coefficient of statistics static friction is, it is a constant it is experimentally calculated you cannot get a value of static friction uh, I mean coefficient of static friction uh, without doing experiment so it is an experimentally determined value and uh, normal for again you know what's normal for sure again that has been def defined in the previous lecture so now We we'll go to something called, I mean, what if the body moves? Yeah. Then again, the block comes into the picture. So, A and B. So, I'm applying a force again, applied force, FA, is in this direction. I'm trying to move the block towards the right. And a block B, again, there is this opposition to the force and here again the static friction acts in the beginning and in the beginning when the body is still at rest it is Fs again the Fs max maximum static friction 
is given by mu s times normal force. Again, the normal force is n. Okay. So the mu s times normal force. Again, this formula is important. What happens after you keep increasing? Here, let's say f a is greater than f s max. So then, what happens is the body begins to slide towards right. The important thing to be noted here is consider this graph here. Time is on the x-axis as usual, and uh, here is the magnitude of or F A or you know, let's take the frictional force F S static friction. Okay, let me take this. So we are taking the magnitude of this uh, static friction on the y-axis and the uh, time on the x-axis. So you get a graph as such as this. You know, while you increase the FA, FS also increases good time. After a certain point, called the point of breakage, what exactly happens is this. So the body the the bond gives away and the body starts sliding so when the body starts sliding if you continue applying more force again okay, there is more frictional force opposing the motion so what you have to do is just as soon as the body moves a bit you in order to uh, for the body to move in a in a in a constant velocity or speed you what you need to do is apply the force at a constant rate. You cannot apply, keep on adding more force and hope that the body moves. So it doesn't happen. So with the force, uh, applied force, the magnitude of the static friction also increases. But after the point of breakage, the body begins to slide. Alright? So this is an important graph that one has to remember. So after the block moves, there is still opposition to the motion and it is called as kinetic friction because the body kinetic means motion as I have told you before. Uh, so the, the opposition offered by the body while in motion to the change in say speed um, or change in its position is called as the kinetic friction. Okay, When the body is at rest, the opposition offered to change in the the state of rest is the static friction then uh, the opposition offered by the body while in motion to uh, uh, change in its positions is called as uh, kinetic friction alright so again kinetic friction can be so again when you apply the force as soon as the body begins to slide you must reduce the applied force and you again you can keep it constant or you might as well reduce because again the friction increases uh, with the applied force all right okay so what we'll do now is uh, we'll see some something called um, as uh, change ports So these are the two types of uh, frictions that I wanted to introduce you to, the static and the kinetic friction. So here, there is one more, again the block, a bigger block this time, uh, say ground here, and the block A that is kept with the normal force acting, and uh, again the force is always towards the right, the applied force, and the friction is always towards the left. Again the block, the same block, but it is, uh, sorry, moving F A. So what happens here? The same bonding that takes place here, yes it does take place, but the thing is the force F A is, is just enough, you know, if you are a very 
a smart boy you will always apply force just enough to overcome the friction so here fa is just enough to overcome that bonding that takes place and what exactly happens is that like you know the boy while the boy travels from this point let's call this point as p to this point q just like you travel from bangalore to boston you have lot of airports the same way the change of ports the ports is nothing but the uh, you know the interaction or the bonding that takes place between the at the localized atoms of the two surfaces so that forms and it breaks it forms and it breaks along the motion of the body and hence it is called as changing ports all right this particular phenomenon that takes place is called as changing port phenomenon and and the friction is always present the reason why this pen is is still in my hand is because of friction the reason why this board is being hanged <laughs> literally is because of friction and in this world without friction i don't know you couldn't even stand and talk you would be sliding all the time <laughs> so uh, literally inertia would be like either you stop or you keep moving either you stay at rest or you keep moving that would that would be inertia and uh, thankfully there is a force called as a frictional force that opposes the motion on earth of course it's present everywhere in, in the universe uh, but it depends on where you you are and uh, and now we shall move on to next phenomena called as cold welding so cold welding is a phenomenon where if i take two polished uh metal here that i'm holding in my hand of course i've done some you know filing to it don't mind but uh, of course these are again two polished metal imagine this is being polished highly polished and i take it to the vacuum chamber then if i place it one over the other what exactly happens is that they bind together forming a single piece it forms a single piece so here if i just join them like this they form a single piece so here again or the other side it's not been done properly but anyway so here if i place it one over one above the other then it forms a single piece of metal in vacuum where the both all these slides are perfectly clean and polished polished surfaces any two polished surfaces will uh, actually form a single piece of metal while you put it in va in vacuum so it's actually something what happens here is when you are it's a similar process to that of the welding isn't it wherein two metal pieces it acts as a single metal piece now it it is in l shape but this acts as a single metal piece doesn't it so the same way that also uh, you know when i put two po polished surfaces in vacuum chamber the the bonding takes place between the two uh, you know sides of uh, of of the metal pieces and hence the metal piece the bonding is strong enough to make the metal piece as one single piece of metal so this is called as cold welding so cold welding it's a process in which a polished metal two shining surfaces or a polished metal brought together in vacuum chamber acts as a single piece of metal is called as cold welding due to the uh, bonding of the strong bonding the strongest of the bondings of uh, you know the the two atoms localized atoms present on the surfaces of the bonding two bonding surfaces so i so said the atoms on present on the two bonding surfaces that's in bonds in such a way that it is almost i mean it forms a single piece of metal of course you can separate them you can separate them by a process called wrenching when you do that wrenching you get the sound this squeaking noise is what you get you know while 
it is so the friction is present here between the two and hence I don't know whether you can hear this noise or not but this this uh, noise is due to the friction frictional force getting converted into sound energy the frictional energy being converted into sound energy in turn my energy is converted in one sense to the frictional I mean the motion of these two objects and the, the frictional force opposing the motion of these two is creating this squeaky noise physics is great isn't it so so why does not actually if I take this two metal pieces itself there is it's not possible to cold weld them together in this state it is because you can see the color of this metal it is black it's actually carbon steel the, this which I'm holding carbon steel uh, but I cannot cold weld this at this state before you know polishing and doing all sort of uh, exercises and dramas uh, so the reason is because of the oxides and the dust materials that are present on the either side of you know of the surfaces of these two metal pieces hence the cold welding is not possible uh, but the welding takes place again but it is so weak that I can easily slide one over the other and the frictional force is so weak so the point is as soon as I increase the, the speed with which uh, you know the relative motion between the two uh, two of these metal pieces the frictional force also increases and uh, but since the force always overcomes that my force uh, the applied force that I'm applying is overcoming that you can hear this squeaky noise so so the thing is if we can define static friction with the help of cold welding so if the cold welding is maximum then the friction uh, is so high that the you know the friction present is the static friction because you know it is it acts as a single body as I said a single entity that means that the body is at rest with respect to each other and uh, hence the cold welding if it is maximum it results in maximum static friction again you know the formula F is equal to mu s times normal force so if it is a little less like in the case that I just demonstrated the body easily moves then it is kinetic friction so now what we will discuss is the properties of friction so the first property of the friction says that if the body doesn't move then the friction Fs is equal to mu s times f okay normal force again the same normal force or some of the textbooks mention it as the normal force f s is equal to mu s n again the block diagram had to be has to be drawn so again the block is at rest in this case because the applied force f a and uh, Fs is equal and are acting at opposite direction hence the body stays at rest so this is the first of the properties of friction so the next the next property is when the static for friction is maximum again the same formula so if the force applied overcomes this Fs max then the body begins to slide and we have drawn that graph and I have told you uh, the static friction increases with the increase of the applied force until the bonds break and the body begins to slide okay so this is the second property of friction 
Again, we'll discuss the coefficient of friction later. The third property is so when the body begins to slide, the frictional force that is from F max decreases to Fk. So F max is is maximum is the larger force opposing the motion. Fk, the kinetic frictional force, is lesser compared to Fs max, and the frictional force decreases from F Fs max to Fk. Okay, this is quite simple, and this is the uh, you know the third property of friction that says you know in one word Fs max is greater than that of the Fk kinetic friction. All right. So this is the third law, and uh, F here Fk can be written as mu k times n. So Fk is mu k times n. Again, here mu k is the coefficient of uh, kinetic friction, and n is the normal force. So now about coefficients. Well, coefficients mu s and mu k that I've written in the previous, uh, you know, formulas for calculating uh, kinetic friction as well as the static friction uh, is dimensionless. It doesn't have any dimension. Hence, friction is also expressed in terms of newtons. And the value of uh, the coefficients are to be calculated experimentally. So I have to do the experiment, then calculate, and they depend upon the certain characteristics of the body and that also that of the, you know, while the body is in motion, it does not depend on the speed, however, that means mu k, that the coefficient of kinetic friction does not depend on the motion of the body, but, or the speed of the body, in one sense, but it, it depends on the properties of both body and the surface in which it is in contact with. So, the, the values of the coefficient of friction depends on the body as well as the surfaces it is in contact with. All right. So this is about the I think um, you know the friction. We are um, we are ending the friction here. Uh, I think this will be sufficient enough for you to uh, work work out the problems uh, on based on this. Of course, I'm going to do a problem at the end, where you know on centripetal forces, but. Um, well, not about the, I mean, not until the end of this series of lectures uh, that we will touch friction or drag. Well, drag we actually never uh, calculated because, as I said, we always ignore drag when the body is falling freely under gravity. But however, not today. Today is not the day. So now, drag. As I said before, if a body, say this ball, is accelerating towards the ground at G, and G is the acceleration, minus G in one sense, and most of the time you never mention G. So again, the drag acts in the opposite direction. So here the drag is D, and so this is the center of the ball, and the ball is falling freely under gravity. So the drag opposes the motion again. It's like a friction, but in the vertical direction, and here, air acts as a fluid like you know if, if there is a fluid flowing through pipes the fluid creates drag on the pipes right or the or the other way so in in here actually the the motion the body while falling free and the gravity is opposed by the drag so drag is a force an opposition force uh, you know, offered by, or in one sense, drag can be called as air resistance. All right, both the same. So here, for the drag, you have a formula: d is equal to half c rho a v squared. So here, c is the coefficient of drag. Again, you'll have to calculate it uh, experimentally. We cannot calculate it here, and uh, Rho is the density of air 
this is the density of air and the A is the area of cross section, it's a perpendicular area, per area perpendicular to that of the, the force, you know, the area, this cross sectional area that we calculate. And again V is the velocity with which the body is accelerating towards the ground, uh, sorry, velocity with which the body is moving towards the ground. I do apologize for that. So, the drag is given by half times coefficient of drag C times the uh, density of the air rho times the area of cross section times the square of the velocity with which the body is moving. Alright? Well, I towards the ground again because it is air drag that we are talking about and the body is always moving towards the ground. Alright? Accelerating towards the ground. So, now so what happens where the force due to gravity is F Fg is equal to mg. Since both force and the acceleration due to gravity are negative, you don't have to write minus mg. Okay? Both minus minus get cancelled and it's a positive uh, you know equation if, if you like it this way. So since the body is uh, if there is a say an another acceleration here, A Okay. This is G, don't get confused between the two. So the acceleration will gravity most of the time which is this itself, you know the acceleration here. Say A, so B minus Mg is equal to A. That's what you write, Ma, right. So here M is the mass of this ball that we are we are considering. Now, B minus, this is Fg and this is acceleration in this direction. Since the body is falling freely under gravity and it doesn't have any sideward acceleration, that means that A here is zero and hence the entire right hand side becomes zero. And here one, we can, we arrive at the equation where B is equal to Fg. So, the drag is equal to Fg. In this case, what happens exactly is the body no longer accelerates and the velocity becomes constant. So at that point, it is called as the body reaches its terminal velocity. The terminal velocity is the velocity, the maximum uh, you know, value of velocity wherein the body no longer accelerates or the velocity does not increase anymore. So, Again, it depends on the area of cross section and yes, the coefficient of drag, uh, you know, but what is the maximum value for the last terminal velocity? So, V terminal, Vt is equal to square root of T Fg by rho A C. So, the same formula here, you substitute Vt is equal to and uh, you replace B with FG from that result that, that we arrived at and uh, you get this equation uh, term for the terminal velocity. Uh, so, so this equation is very very important for anyone who wants to solve. Of course again you will have to know the value of C, the coefficient of drag uh, in order to equate and uh, it can only be determined by experiment. Coefficient of drag, well, say you are a skier who is uh, you know, skiing down a mountain slope on the snow, of course, then the value of uh, C is quite predictable. It's, it varies, always it varies throughout the motion. It varies from 0.4 to 1.0. So, uh, this, that, I mean you can take the value from anywhere between 0.4 and 1 and, and do the calculation to an approximate value, alright, but again yes, it is very important that one does an experiment in order to determine the exact value of the coefficient of drag.
So, since we are done with uh, the drag, I have told you the terminal velocity, uh, uh, it's, a velo it's a maximum velocity after which the body no longer accelerates or uh, the velocity also doesn't change because the drag on the body as well as the force due to gravity both get equaled and there is no more acceleration of the body in the vertical direction and hence at this point the velocity rem uh, remains constant and or reaches its maximum value and it is called as the terminal velocity okay so and we have written the formula for that uh, terminal velocity is uh, square root of 2 times uh, fg that is the force due to gravity by c rho uh, c rho and uh, a c rho a so c rho a where c is the coefficient of drag rho is the density of the air and uh, a is the area of cross section remember area of cross section all right so now we'll go to the uniform circular One of my physics teacher always wrote circular like circle with LAR to the power of LAR. So uh, it's one of those interesting things that he always used to do for fun. So I'm going to do the same here. Uh, uniform circular motion is a circular motion in which the body travels a circular path wherein the only acceleration is the acceleration due to the change of direction of the body. Okay. So the magnitude of velocity does not change and this is the R and this is the O okay and we have discussed about it in the ac centripetal acceleration here again there is a force acting towards the center it is called a centripetal force so centripetal force Fc is given by Ma again while you apply the neutral, neutral loss but here again the acceleration in this case the centripetal acceleration is v squared by r hence again if in this you substitute ac the acceleration you do uh, ac centripetal acceleration again then you get m v squared by r as the formula so the centripetal force is given by fc is equal to m v squared by r and uh, you know the time period experiment we discussed uh, that it is c by v C is the circumference of the of the circular path that is 2 pi r by v. So it is you know, all the formulas that you will need while all the formulas that you will need while solving problems are here on the board. You know the time period you can calculate it with the uh, uh, 2 pi r by v and uh, the centripetal force is nothing but m v squared by r. So that's how you derive it. It's a simple two-step derivation that I can do but you can write all sort of things like where f is uh, there is uh, a m is the mass of the object that is rotating I think it's all simple and uh, well if you need marks you can write all those things but to understand I think this is the, a simple way of doing it so um, so centripetal force is I mean centripetal acceleration is the acceleration of the body caused due to the change in direction of the body since velocity is a vector as well as the acceleration velocity here if the cha there is change in direction it is also acceleration not just in the change in the magnitude of the velocity it's also due to the change in the direction of the velocity here the magnitude of the velocity is not changing only the direction is changing hence it's uniform circular motion and the body is tracing a circular path and it is accelerating and that acceleration is v squared by r. We will discuss however in the coming chapters but what happens if the body is not moving in uniform circular motion. So what happens you just have to add you will have to know the differentiation. Uh, uh, you know uh, how to solve the de the derivatives. You need to know the derivatives, how to solve them and stuff. So again, we will uh, definitely discuss about that as well. But uh, as of now, I don't I don't fancy discussing that because um, whoever have uh, commented said that you use more mathematics. So 
Again, physics is all about mathematics. I mentioned in the first of the lectures in the introductory lectures to physics, physics is nothing without mathematics. Uh, just like you, if you are not able to share feelings in whatever the language you speak, whatever the mother tongue you have, you'll just be a person who looks and hides all the emotions and whatever you become, you get depressed or whatever. In the same way, physics is also, uh, you know, armless without mathematics. So, and, and again, if you don't know mathematics, you will never understand physics. It's as simple as it is. The simplest of the rules. So now, um, so I tend to forget the name of the person again. Uh, we are actually trying to solve a problem, as I said. It's one of my favorite problems uh, that I did. It's more most exciting problems, actually. I'm not going to dictate. I'm going to just tell you the problem, dictate the problem. Yeah. So this, you know, the stunt drivers, what they do is they take the bike. I'm, I know my drawing is very bad, so don't mind. So there is a person sitting here and, uh, you know, and he drives it so that he traces the circular path and uh, you know, the body comes here. Okay. He is in an inverted position here. So the normal force is also down. His acceleration is also down or you know, the force due to gravity is also down. FG is also down. So at this point of time, he is in contact with uh, the, the, you know, the tarmac and, and he comes down this path and, uh, and again, here the body, the person has to, uh, whoever is riding the bike has to trace this circular path and then come again here. So we'll just, uh, you know, for you need physicists to determine what's the minimum velocity that is needed for him to go around this and come down safely without breaking his back. So we'll calculate the minimum velocity that is required by that particular person. Diablo is one of the first person who started this stunt. So let's say Diablo is the person riding the bike and what is the minimum velocity that he needs in order to maintain uh, contact with the tarmac or whatever the patch of wooden patch that they usually use. So what is the minimum velocity? So in order to calculate the minimum velocity here, I told you the normal force is also acting down, the gravitational force is also acting down and the acceleration is also towards the ground at this point of time. The acceleration is towards this side, sorry. So what you do is the force, normal force, Fn minus Fg, the gravitational force is is equal to that of, uh, again, the acceleration is also down, but the body is moving in this direction, so velocity would be in this direction, again. Okay. So it is minus A because the acceleration is towards the downward axis. So then what you do is, uh, since the body here, we'll just consider from this point, from here to here, it's a circle of motion that he is tracing. It's a circle of motion, it's a circle that he is tracing. Hence, the acceleration here will be Fn is equal to minus, sorry, Fn minus, minus Fn minus Fg because the normal force is acting downwards, not upwards as usual. So, here M minus V squared by R, I would say. So, here the radius has been given much. Okay, the radius of the circular track is 2.7 meters. So the radius is 2.7 meters and you know the values. Now, now these two are equal and they cancel out. Hence, we are, we are substituting for R, right? V is equal to g times r right? okay anyway hold on the normal force okay so sorry about this skip the step so the normal force here is almost zero why because he is just we are measuring the minimum velocity for him 
to go around the track safely. So these are the words of losing contact. So almost there is no contact at all between the tires and the path. There is almost no contact. So almost. There is contact, otherwise as I said, he would break his back. But since the, the contact is just a, a mere what? There is no force actually. Even if it is there, it is very negligible. So what we will do is we will take Fn is 0. So the normal force acting downwards is almost 0, but not 0, literally. Hence, you minus out that. And young Fg, you know, it is young g is equal to m minus v squared by r from this equation. So the m m cancels, and the v is nothing but r g times root. So you put g is equal to 10, and r is equal to 2.7 into 10 is nothing but 27. Root of 27 is somewhere equal to 5.1 meter per second. So what he has to do, the Diablo person Diablo has to do is uh, in order to safely return home by not ending up in a hospital by break, by breaking his bone he has to have a minimum velocity of 5.1 meter per second in order to go around this track and come or go home safe in one sense and entertain a this so it's all about physics you guys so actually if you study physics many people wonder where do you get the jobs See, you can go with a stuntman and you can do all the calculations and then also you can be more famous, you know, a lot of people come and watch these kind of shows abroad, of course not much here in India. Anyway, so there is always scope for physics because it is physics. So, so one more uh, instant that I forgot to mention, so if you are in a car that is you know, you are sitting in the back seat and uh, so you are in a corner, so the car is cornering in this way, you know, cornering. So the thing is, you are pushed towards the door. So what exactly is happening here? So the car is tracing this curve, I mean, in a big sense, it's a big circle and at every point, you know, there is a say a center. So the force is acting towards the center, and it's called a centripetal force. Again, Fc is given by mv squared by r, right? So always Fc acts towards the center, and hence the car is able to turn, okay? Because of the presence of centripetal force. The point is, why are you thrown out? Is because there is not enough friction between your body and the seat to keep you in this centripetal motion, centripetal portion. So what exactly happens here is the, the, the frictional force that, it, that keeps you on the seat is not just enough to hold you in place. So that's the reason the car slides underneath you and you go and hit the door. So not the opposite happens, okay? So this is very important for you one to remember and uh, this is the effect. So why do you need uh, the previous problem that says why do you need these things to study? Well, the answer is in front of you. So you understand what happens around you in a better way and that's, that's very very important for one uh, in order to understand how the nature works. Alright? So, it's a, it's a goodbye from me now. Uh, I hope you enjoy watching this lecture. And uh, and keep watching and keep spreading the word science and and take care.